Welcome to EET 3229C Communication Systems at Valencia College for the fall semester of 2020. This is your lecturer, Dr. Wilfredo Rivas Torres. And today we will be looking at lecture number six, which has two parts. And the topic will be digital data transmission. So the topics for this lecture is an introduction to digital communication systems. We will also talk about line coding, pulse shaping, digital receivers and regenerative repeaters and the eye diagram. So throughout much of the 20th century, um, most of the systems were analog, right? It, it was kind of towards the, by the end of the 1990s that digital transmission began to dominate. And, and sure enough, we had digital before that and we were conscious of it, but this is the point where most people agree at least that digital be, began to overtake uh, analog communications. So, um, this is a thing that we're going to study next, right? We're going to be studying digital data transmission. And we always are going to make the assumption that our messages going in are digital. So somewhere along the way, you digitize your signal and pretty much what you have are, is the bits, the ones and zeros, right? So our message signal, our M of T, right, is going to be now in digital form, right? We, we already know how to convert it to digital and that was our original M of T. Let's, let's go ahead and uh, from this point on make, make the assumption that everything is digital. Um, and since we're going to be talking a lot about the binary case, right, what that means is that we have data that consists of only two symbols, right, a one and a zero. Notice that I went very carefully and I called it symbols, and this will become uh, uh, sort of make sense to you as we go um, further down into the course, okay? Now, for each symbol, right, we're going to assign a distinct waveform or pulse, right? We we did all this study when we studied uh, the, the Fourier transform, and we would always just have, like, one pulse or one waveform, and then we duplicate that and make it periodic. Th this is all... Uh, so all these things, hopefully, by now you see that they're all related and they all have to do with each other. And that's the way we, why we explain it. And we go through all that process when we're discussing the Fourier transform. Now, once you have the resulting sequence of your data bearing pulses, then this is the stuff that we want to send over the channel, right? And then at the receiver, what well, the job of the receiver is to take all this, this waveform and these pulses, you want to be able to detect them and convert them back to binary data, data, excuse me, in terms of ones and zeros. So here's a picture of a fundamental building blocks that make up a digital system, and we'll discuss them all. We've talked a lot about the channel, and we've talked about a lot about multiplexing, so we're not going to spend a lot of time there. But we will talk about the other blocks, OK? Um, uh, and, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, reinforce the topic that the sense that we are that the input to our digital system is always going to be a sequence of digits that are already in binary form or some digital form, right? And that's going to be the input to our source encoder. So the digital output of the source encoder, right, uh, is to take uh, the, uh, our data and uh, put it into the baseband modulation, right? Into some kind of code that this baseband modulation or line coding would understand. And then this is what prepares the data for it to be transmitted. Notice that these are all ones and zeros. And this may not look to you like ones and zeros, this part, this part, this output from the baseband or line coding, but it, the digital information is in there, right? And this is the process that we call baseband modulation, line coding, or even they call it transmission coding. Now, 
in order to do this, what, what is this line coding, right? Let's discuss this line coding. So there's definitely many different ways for you to represent your digital data. This is the pulses or the waveforms that we're going to use, right? Um, in the binary case where we have two symbols, conceptually, the simplest line code is just on and off, right? Where a one is transmitted by the presence of a pulse, P of T, and a zero is no pulse at all, zero signal. And that's what we see in uh, this figure uh, A, right? Figure 62.2A. Notice here's the bits, 110, 111, 001, et cetera, right? Notice that whenever you have a one, you have a pulse, and when there's a zero, there's no pulse, okay? And we call that on-off coding, right? Uh, another uh, and another popular code, right? And remember, that's 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 a function of this so this uh, baseband modulation or line coding. Uh, another commonly used uh, code is polar, where a one is transmitted with a pulse PFT and a zero is transmitted by a minus pulse or a minus PFT. So going here to the figure part, figure B here. Uh, notice that the ones, one, 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 but whenever we have a zero, instead of having no signal, we actually have a minus or the, we completely um, uh, reverse the polarity of the pulse, right? Um, and this is very efficient, right? If you notice, there's, uh, if you run this long enough and it's random enough, you end up with no DC power, for example. And even the power of your carrier, it, this is the most efficient thing that you can do, right? Or it's more efficient than on, off, etc. Another uh, popular line code is PCM. And it's uh, bipolar, where zeros are encoded by no poles, but the ones are encoded by uh, alternating your PFT between positive and negative. And uh, it's a little bit, might be counterintuitive when you guys think about it, but Here's a one, because I have another one, I'm actually gonna flip it. And then I have another one, so I'm gonna flip it. Zero is still absence of any pulse, so no pulse means zero, zero. And this one is a one, but because the last one was positive, this one becomes negative, right? And that's what we call a, a PCM bipolar code. Um, so far, we, we've shown half with pulses, and that's out of convenience. Right, it's easier to show, uh, uh, but full poles uh, are often used in, in different applications. Um, so when you do that, it's just that the pulse width is held constant the whole time. See, here is a one. See, it, it, it's, notice that the signal never drops back to zero. There's that one. Here's another one and another one, right? Then it, it only drops down when you have a zero and a zero, then back a one. Notice that throughout the whole pulse, or um, we call it, throughout the whole duration, the pulse is held constant. Um, and for these reasons, uh, these are uh, all called, uh, these are all called non-return zero. Uh, something a little bit, uh, okay, yeah, fine. And in contrast to the return zero scheme, so you see the pulse goes up and it always returns to zero. D, this one, even though never really returns to zero, only when it's zero. And then um, the last one do we have, okay, the last code here is a polar non-return zero, which is, it's either a plus value or a negative value. So anytime you have a negative value, it's a zero and a plus value is a one okay and this is a non-return zero as well because it never returns this one really never returns to zero okay um so let's talk about the concept of pulse shaping now why would we talk about this now again you have to remember your uh your time when we were talking about the fourier transforms right so it, we we said that whenever you have something that of finite duration and time, it's infinite duration and frequency. And in the, in the reverse of that is true. If it's finite and bandwidth, it's infinite in time, right? 
Um, so we want to be able to control whatever our output digital signal is, let's call it Y of T. We want to be able to control the power spectral density of that waveform. Now, the power spectral density of that waveform is strongly and directly influenced by the pulse shape, whatever the shape of our pulse is. Right now we were using these uh, rectangular pulses and we already know that that's not very efficient in terms of uh, its power spectral density, right? It requires to go to infinity in, in, in reality, right? And so, and we never go to infinity in practice, right? So in, the pulse shape is uh, what is the th the factor that controls the power spectral density. Uh, we will now, we'll next, uh, Next time, how to select either P of T or P of F, right? They're, they're part of the same thing. Remember when we talked about that thing, again, back when we started talking about the Fourier transfer, we can look at things in the time domain or in the frequency domain. They're representations of the same signal. We'll look to uh, to do, how do we shape this pulse such that we mitigate things that are uh, happening through a limited channel bandwidth, right? Especially we want to look at this concept of self-interference, right? Um, and we'll talk some more about that. Um, if we uh, do nothing and we just try to send, let's say, the, the, the square pulses, uh, we would have problems with our detection, right? Uh, this would uh, definitely hamper uh, the detection of the digital baseband signal at the receiver. Now let's talk about this concept of intersymbol interference, and you will hear this throughout your career frequently, or ISI, right? Uh, in the case of the rectangular pulse, right? I already mentioned that the the bandwidth would have to be infinite, right, for the rectangular pulse, right? Um, but we know that the pulse spectral density uh, of a of the signal, for example, uh, for the um, bipolar signal case, most of its power, right, from the power from the power spectral density, is actually contained in the band that goes from zero to whatever your uh, bit rate is, right. So if I say, oh, I have a signal that goes at a bit rate of one megahertz. I know that between zero and one megahertz is where I contain most of my energy, okay? Um, so what we're saying is that the power spectral density is low amplitude uh, after this bandwidth of RB hertz, uh, but still remains non-zero. It really doesn't go to zero, right? So if I were to have a like a brick wall filter and I were able to cut it right at the RB uh, frequency, bandwidth, um, I would actually be throwing away information, right, or part of my signal. Um, another way of saying this is that when you try to send such a pulse, right, such an ideal pulse, a strong send through a, a, a channel, and our channels we have mentioned uh, many times that our channels have a low pass uh, frequency response, uh, we would have to have a strict bandwidth of RB hertz, right? Um, but even if you were to do that, to to, to try to do that, right? Um, what happens is you, like I said, is you're pretty much uh, eliminating, uh, even if it's a small portion of the spectrum, uh, and that never reaches the receiver. Um, now, remember, uh, I started off by saying if you limit the frequency domain, that means you have wider spread in the time domain. So that's what this distortion from the channel will cause to your digital data, right? You try to send out this really nice, perfect rectangular pulses, uh, but the channel can't handle it, right? So it chops off some of the frequency. And what happens in the time domain, when you look at it, the pulse spreads. Now, what do we mean by pulse spreading? So in the one megahertz case, it means that the time that we're allowing every bit is one microsecond, right? But if we try to send it through this channel that is going to be uh, 
have a low pass characteristics when the that same pulse is received right after going to this low pass channel it will have a duration of longer than one microsecond so it will encroach in the time from the next bit and then they're all doing that right so this is why we call it intersymbol interference so one symbol interferes with the other all in the time domain right because they get sort of this this effect where they are um, dispersed in time okay and this is what we know again as intersymbol interference or isi now note that the pulse amplitudes can still be detected correctly this despite this uh, dispersion right if and only if there is no isi at the decision making instance now what do we mean by that remember when we were talking about sampling we were talking about sampling and going back to my one microsecond uh, bit time let's say that we have 10 samples well when it re reaches the receiver and we're trying to make the decision if it's a one or a zero I don't normally look at the 10 samples. I am only interested in one, okay? Across the pulse, right? Let's say we have a flat pulse for argument's sake at this point. Um, they're all the same, so I really only need one. It's just I have to pick the one where at this decision-making instance, right, there is no interstimal interference. Now, how do we do that? The way you do that is you shape the pulse properly so that it is band limited, but you have that perfect uh, sampling point where you're going to make the decision. Okay. So Mr. Nyquist proposed three different criteria. We are only going to look at one, um, uh, and and but they are the the thing about it is is that the pulses are shaped to cause zero or controlled interference, right? To other to other, other pulse, pulses at the critical decision-making instance. That's what this is all about, right? Um, again, we're only interested in limiting the interference at the decision-making instance. Um, that way we eliminate any unreasonable need for band limiting the pulse to Total will be non-overlapping, right? We don't have to worry about how do I going to do this? I cannot allow them to overlap. Yes, you can allow them to overlap as long as the overlap, whatever it is, does not affect the decision-making instance, okay? So let's talk about how, how do we pulse shape for zero ISI at that decision instance, right? So what we want to do is we want to, design a pulse such that, and we, we've kind of seen this already, right? Um, we want to do that such that um, at the time instance where we're interested in taking the sample, the pulses do not in, sort of interfere with each other. And, and the way we do that is uh, the pulses one at t equals zero and zero at any every other, um, integer of uh, the bit time which is tb here right it's easier to see it in an example um and we've seen these sync functions before right so if i do a, a pulse right and have the sync function and i time it the right way okay i time everything the right way notice this sync function by the time it gets to the next tb or the next bit it is zero but the other bit is maximum right and now the interference of this 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 uh solid line when i go to 2b note again it's zero the one from the one that was at tb again is zero and the only one that exists here is the, the one that's sort of been at 2b and this is the ideal sampling time uh, i will say that um just because they're all positive they're all ones here um this does not apply when there's, they're negative right it does not mean that it does apply it's just that it makes a much more messy picture Okay, that's why they, we make them all ones. Now, any pulse that can satisfy a criteria like this, right, causes zero intersymmetric uh, interference, 
at the pulse centers. That's what we're looking at, right? Let's say we want to sample at the pulse center. That's an ideal sampling time. And we'll see a little while a, a tool that helps to determine what that instance is, when it's right to uh, sample, what's the, the best instance time. Um, but if we can create a pulse like that, we have what we need, right? Uh, we're perfect. We, we can allow interference anywhere else, as long as it doesn't happen at the uh, instance of time where I need to make my decision. And sure enough, the sync function, right? If we can get a sync pulse, that would be absolutely fabulous, right? But we already know, right, that the sync pulse has a little bit of a problem, right? The sync pulse, right, unfortunately, uh, it would be the minimum bandwidth pulse, but it's not feasible because it has to start at minus infinity in order for you to get that, right? So, we, and we just don't do that in, in the real world, okay? So how do we do pulse shaping? And, and again, this is where um, Mr. Nyquist uh, came up and just the brilliancy, right? Um, a practical filter that satisfies Nyquist's first criteria is what's called the raised cosine filter, right? And it's followed this equation, and I know some of you might be looking at it, oh, this is sort of um, not an easy thing to, to follow. But, but the implications of it is easy, right? And again, if you ever want to do this, uh, let's go, you know, go back to MATLAB or, or Octave and just program this. And it's, it's, you start getting a sort of an intuitive feel, right? I'm not going to do that uh, this time, but you guys can definitely do that by now. This formula should not be that difficult for you guys to program. Now, let's look at it. Uh, we're going to walk through this sort of in an example form, if you will. So there's three curves here, and we'll talk about what FX and R are in just a second, right? So we sh we're showing three curves, one for FX equals zero, what means R is equals zero, FX equals RB over four, where yes, RB is our um, bit rate, right? So that is uh, RB over four, and then the heavy dash line, right? So this is the one RB over four. Notice this RB over two. If you add one, you, you land at three RB over four. That's So this FX is the difference between RB over two and whenever this lands at zero. And then there's one uh, for FX equals RB over two or R equals one. That goes all the way up to RB and then that's where it reaches zero, okay? All right. So it can be seen that increasing FX or R simplifies the implementation of the pulse because you have a more gradual cutoff, right? That's what you're really looking at. And the oscillatory nature of PFT, the time domain signal, right? Um, so it makes those things more gradual and causes it to decay more rapidly in the time domain. Right, so if I let f of x be zero, notice you have a perfect brick wall and you pretty much get, guess what, the sync function back, right? It's pretty much the sync function. That's the solid line here. Um, then you see the two dash lines, the, the more the solid dash line, you, you can see that it's so much more lower in, in amplitude. So they tend to zero much faster than the, the, than the regular uh, sync-like pulse, okay? That's what that's trying to say there. Um, now the bandwidth of this uh, power spectral density or P of F for, for this pulse is 0.5 or half your bit rate plus F of X. So F of X is uh, what we call the bandwidth excess. So anything above 0.5 RB is what F of X is, right? Um, and then the R is really a ratio that we call the ratio of uh, of the excess bandwidth to the theoretical minimum bandwidth RB, right? So excess bandwidth or F of X divided by the minimum bandwidth is just 0.5 or half of the uh, bit rate, right? So this is what R is. It tells you what's the ratio of those two numbers, okay? That's why this is 0.5, right? RB over four divided by RB over two. If you do the, the math, it, you end up at 0.5. Okay.
Now, observe that f of x cannot be any larger than rb over 2 because we want it to, at the very least, to reach 0 by the time rb or, or your bit rate. Okay? So that implies that r has to be between 0 and 1, which is nice and convenient, right? You, you, whenever you look at it, you know that you're going to set an r which is between 0 and 1. Okay? Um, so if we know what fx is and we know what rb is, you can determine the bandwidth of the power spectral density is simply rb over 2 plus uh, the rolling factor, the roll off factor, that's what we call r, times rb over 2 or 1 plus r over the uh, min times the minimum bandwidth or the bit rate over 2. Okay? All right, so oh, I meant to do that to do this. Uh, uh, we want to do a pulse uh, spectrum as the one in the figures that we were just looking at. Let's say that we have an excess bandwidth of 0.8 megahertz and a bit time of 0.5 microsecond. Determine the rate at which the binary data can be transmitted, right? And what is the roll-off factor? Well, the data rate is nothing but the the bit time TB. 1 over TB is 2 megahertz. Then the roll-off factor, and this is where the book has a mistake, is fx divided by 0.5 times RB. I think they forgot to multiply by uh, 0.5. It should have been 1 e to the 6. And then you get the correct uh, roll-off factor of 0.8. Okay. Now, if you were wondering what is it that this pulse shaping or this uh, cosine rays fill. By the way, this, these filters are called cos rays cosine filters, right? <laughs> I, I I got so uh, um, a little bit ahead of myself, forgot to mention that these are rays cosine filters. Um, what is it that a rays cosine filter does? What what is this pulse shaping? Uh, I tried to look for a better picture just with a digital signal. Uh, I couldn't find one uh, right away, so I, I'm just going to do this pulse shaping. Notice that the blue signal is the original signal, right? And we're going to see something like this in a little while. But notice that how that it's again, it's a, these are rectangular pulses, right? Um, if I did nothing with the rectangular pulses, what you're going to see in the power spectral density is what you see in blue down here, right? Uh, notice that this is going plus or minus five megahertz. Uh, I, I'm, this is a symbol rate of of one megahertz, right? Notice how you have all these other images of, of your signal, right? Um, which kind of tells you how much bandwidth you need, right? You still need much more bandwidth than you're showing here to kind of keep this rectangular shape. What the pulse shaping thing does is from a power spectral density, you get the red um, the red trace here. So notice how uh, it came and actually reduce all this bandwidth it's really nice and by the way it took care of your intersymbol interference problem right if you want to kind of see well how can it do that well remember that we said we would sample somewhere in the middle notice for example this one notice that the signal comes up and actually goes over the pulse we don't care about that because the instance is somewhere in the middle which is here Notice that in this pulse, the, in, the middle and the peak of the pulse happen to coincide, but not here anymore, right? So sometimes when you see, right, this is where you would sample, sample is in the middle of the pulse. It's hard to see the pulses when they're all the same value for a little while. But you got, even on the negative side, you can see here's what I would have sampled, right? This is probably the right sampling point, okay? And at that point, we're saying there's no inner symbol interference. Everywhere else there could be, but not at the, uh, at the sampling points. Okay, <clears throat> or the decision points. All right. Um, so talking about uh, the receivers, um, the the receiver has three functions, right? It has to reshape the incoming pulses, right, by some means of an equalizer, and we'll we'll talk about why an equalizer, um, and what is an equalizer. Extracting it has to extract timing information or it has to get it from somewhere, and then at the end of the day, it has to make the, deci the, de the decision 
or the symbol detection decision. Uh, is it a one, is it a zero in the case of a binary uh, signal, right? Um, the basic uh, repeater is shown in this figure, 6.21. Um, I really don't want you guys to get too wrapped up in this regenerative repeater. We did mention this before, right? One of the advantages of using the is you can have a regenerative repeater. Really, honestly, um, the first person of a repeater is nothing but a receiver. So this is the receiver portion of the repeater because in a real repeater, you would then take these digital pulses at the end, you would remodulate them and send them back through the channel, right? If this is your end receiver, then you have the digital pulses and then you're going to process your digital data from that point on, okay? So in the concept of this lecture, uh, whenever I say digital receiver or if I say repeater, I, I, they're not exactly the same thing, but in this lecture, they end up kind of being that. Okay, so an equalizer. Let's talk about equalizer. So a baseband signal, right, is going to be attenuated and distorted by the transmission medium or the channel, right? Now, we need a, a something to compensate for the attenuation. Normally, we do those with amplifiers, right? Whereas that frequency or time distortion, that we correct with an equalizer. Now, an equalizer, what is that? Why? Well, the channel distortion um, and the form of distortion, uh, this is because of the frequency response of your channel. There will be certain frequency components, right, that are affected in different ways than other frequency components for your data. An equalizer, in theory, has a frequency characteristic that is the inverse of whatever that distortion, that frequency dependent distortion does to your data. So it should be the inverse, right? Yeah, if you think about it, the inverse of some, if you have a number, right, and you do the reciprocal, which is the inverse, you multiply those two, you end up with one. What does that mean in terms of the channel, right, to do the inverse? Well, if I have the channel and I can do the inverse of it, right, it means that the data that I put in is exactly the same data that I get out, right? So because the this equalizer would compensate for that distortion, okay? Um, there is a little sort of tricky thing with equalizers, um, and it's that um, the equalizer could enhance receiver channel noise because it boosts the wrong, the wrong components. Remember, noise is something that get, that's not at the input, right? We don't pr purposely add noise to our signal. Right, so noise is something that it picks up through the channel, um, and uh, you need to design your equalizer to make sure that you don't enhance the noise at the receiver. Otherwise, you uh, uh, pretty much uh, cause more harm than good by using the equalizer. Right, and this is a phenomenon that's called noise amplification. You have to, so you still have to be careful with your equalizers and when it comes to noise. Right. Um, the kind of cool thing or nice thing about digital single tire is complete equalization is, in fact, not necessary. Because um, remember, we only care about the decision, uh, the signal when at the moment we're going to make that decision. Is it a one or a zero in the binary case, right? Um, therefore, you can still so tolerate some considerable residual pulse dispersion, right? Um, and the, and um, and, and, and noise enhancement res, uh, resulting from the equalizer, so you can deal with dispersion. We already mentioned that, and you can deal with noise um, as long as uh, none of this is affecting the decision instance, and therefore. Uh, by using the equalizer, you can increase. Uh, if you don't design your equalizer properly, you can increase the noise and therefore increase your detection error probability. Um, we're, most of the uh, digital communication um, studies, actually, we spend a long, t a lot of time speaking about detection error probability. Um, and this is how many bits you get in error, 
right? You were supposed to get a one, you get a zero, you get a zero, you get a one. Um, in this course, being an introductory communication course, we are not going to do that. Actually, the second half of the book, starting in chapters seven, I think it's through 12, that's all they're talking about mo or mostly talking about, right? It's about error probability, how to deal with it, how to characterize it, etc. Again, uh, that would be the second part of a course like this, right? So designing an optimum equalizer actually involves uh, a compromise between mitigating inner symbol interference and suppressing channel noise. So there's always a compromise like everything else. Um, so the choice of the equalizer is central to a digital communicate, a well-designed digital communication system. All right, so let's talk timing, right? Everything has to do with timing when it comes to digital, right? So digital ne signal needs to be sampled at this is an instance for symbol detection, right? We want to be able to detect what we send back. That will always require some form of a clock for synchronism, right? Uh, symbol or big synchronization. There's, there's three methods that are used, right? One is derivation from a primary or secondary clock, right? Uh, that is the transmitter, oops, sorry. The transmitter and the receiver are both connected or slave to the same master clock, right? This is not so bad when they're not too far away from each other, but if they are far away from each other, it, that can be uh, kind of costly. That means you have to send another wire just for the clock, for example. Um, now, because it's high cost, if there's a lot of data going through, right, so that it sort of uh, makes it f uh, feasible, right, then by all means, you just send the clock right and however else you have to send it so that it keeps everything synchronized um, you can send a, another way number two is transmission of a separate auxiliary synchronization or pilot clock for the receiver now this method is actually part of the data that you're sending right it's a pilot right so there's a section of your data of your bits that's actually tells the uh, receiver, here's your timing information so you can keep track of everything, right? Um, the thing about this is it's suitable when there's excess channel capacity. I mean, you have more bandwidth and data rate that you need, uh, or you're willing to live with it taking up channel capacity. And normally that means you have to have more transmit power, right? Because you're sending more data, that's the natural thing. And there's also this self-synchronization, and there's a lot of work that people do in this, this area, right? Where the receiver actually, based on information, so you do nothing else but send the information, and from the signal itself, it extracts the clock, right? So it, it's actually one of those um, things in technology that's really nice to look at, right? You, all you have is data. You have no information as to what the original clock was, and out of the data, we can actually extract this with different techniques like phase lock loops, etc. Right? We won't study that, but that that is possible, right? So, um, it, it's and I think there's still people that are uh, uh, deeply studying ways of doing this, right? All right. I promise to talk about detection errors. Uh, again, we're just not going to talk a, a really a whole lot about it, but. Once the transmission has passed through the equalizer, the testing can take place at the receiver, right? Um, based on the samples and making sure that you have extracted the, the timing some way or have the timing available. Um, now, when you look at the detector, this is where you're gonna make that decision. Do I have a one or a zero in the binary case, right? Um, you're going to have the pulses that come out of the equalizer, right? But there's going to be something else there, right? There's always going to be noise, right? That, that got picked up through the channel. Now, this noise can cause errors in pulse detection, right? 
So let's consider, let's say we have a pulse that after we shape it looks something like this, right? Like we have here in the figure A, okay? Notice we have a pulse with a peak A of P. Let's say that's our perfect place to make our decision if it's a one or a zero, right? Um, let's say the pulse uh, received looks like the solid line down here, right? Here's one. Notice that because it's pointing down, we're gonna call that, a, that's a zero. Uh, here's another pulse because it's on the upper side. We're going to call it a one. So that makes this horizontal line our decision threshold. Anything above it at decision time means a one. Anything below it means a zero at decision time. Um, now, if you had no inner symbol interference and noise, you would see this solid line, right? There's no no inner similar interference, there's no noise, you, you would see the solid line. You would actually see copies of the original pulse, either positive or negative, right? Now, by considering the additive noise, these samples could be plus or minus AP at the decision time. Remember, we're talking about the decision time, plus noise, or plus N, where N here is the random noise, right? And remember, noise is random. So it, it, it happens everywhere, and you really never know what the value of it is, right? So now notice that you have the dotted line, right? It kind of looks like the original pulses most of the time, right? But not all the time, and we'll talk some more about that. Um, so without reading all of this, uh, what we want to look at is at some point, the noise can be so large, right, that it actually flips a one or a zero, right? That's the right here in the middle. See the dotted, the dash or dotted line? Notice that there was so much noise during this period that instead of having a zero, you actually detect the one because the signal, right, our negative signal plus our positive noise made the signal go above zero, above this horizontal flat line, and we erroneously detected this signal, right? And we call that an error. Now, when you have data, right, the worst thing that can happen to you is one of them is, one of them is wrong, and if you have multiple of them wrong, then you really are getting into trouble. So that's why we call, talk about uh, error probability uh, of right because noise is random and we want to be able to do this sort of uh, as as a rate right um, so the performance of any digital communication system is typically specified by the average number of detection errors right you really want to make that as small as zero ideally you would like to make it zero but as small as possible. Right, and the average ratio of the numbers of errors really what matters to you, right? So if I transmit a million bits, I would like to get a million bits correct, but what if I get 999, bits? So I got 10 bits wrong. How how big of a, a a detection error was that, right? And again, because noise is random. We tend to look at this comparison as the likelihood of detection error or detection error probability. Okay, these are some of the concepts that are covered in those uh, in the second half of the textbook, right? Which we're not covering. Um, and you know, the precise analysis and the evaluation of this error likelihood is um, requires knowledge of probability theory, which is beyond the scope of our class. Okay, and that's why we we're not talking any more about that topic. But I do want to show you guys what a, a typical set of graphs are. Now, again, I try to look for a, a much simpler graph. There's a lot of things here that we haven't talked about yet, but we are gonna talk about in the, in the second part of our lecture. But this energy per bit to noise power ratio, forget about energy per bit, just think about that this is signal to noise ratio. And yes, energy per bit to noise power ratio is directly related. There's a relationship to signal to noise ratio. 
So if I had not put EB over N0 and put signal to noise ratio, you guys would have never noticed the difference, okay? Um, for the most part. Um, and what this is showing is for the different kinds of modulation, and we're going to study this modulation again in part two, right? For this thing called BPSK, we're going to talk about that. Um, notice that as the signal to noise ratio increases, this bit error rate, that's what BER stands for, right? That's that error rate. Um, and we put it in percentage on, on this graph. Notice that the higher the signal to noise ratio, the lower the bit error rate, which is what we want. Right. And if you remember Shannon's law, right, channel capacity, it's kind of the same thing. The capacity increases, right? And it's the capacity for an error free, right, transmission. Right. The same thing happens here. The bit error rate and uh, becomes lower, which is what we want in terms of bit error rate, the higher the signal to noise ratio. So it pays off to increase the signal to noise ratio. Now, depending on the kind of modulation that you're using, you might, for the same error rate, right? Let's say, let's take the 10 e to the minus 2 percentage, that's 0.01%. Um, notice that the different modulations uh, after BPSK always need a higher signal to noise ratio, right? And what's happening here for the same amount of bandwidth, right? You're sending more data. Because you're sending more data, you're going to need a higher uh, signal to noise ratio for the same error rate. That's kind of what this graph is telling you. Okay. Uh, and that's in a nutshell. We won't really talk much more about this going forward, but I, I thought it was important to give you guys uh, this picture. All right. We did say that there was a tool that we could use to determine the ideal um, decision point, right? And that tool is called an eye diagram. Now, eye diagram does more than just that. Let's let's look at it. So, eye diagrams. One of the nice things about this is that they're easy to generate. All you need all you need is an oscilloscope, right? Um, as long as it can sample at the right sampling rate that you're interested in, of course, right? It's a useful diagnostic tool. Um, this eye diagram makes it possible to visually inspect the receive signal for the severity of your inner symbol interference, the accuracy of the timing, how much noise and immunity you have, and other factors. I already mentioned all you need is an oscilloscope. And what it does is it sort of takes samples at your um, symbol time. Right, uh, and if it's binary, it will be the bit time, and it just overlays them one on top of each other. Right, so what you do is you look at the signal for one symbol time, sometimes two symbol times, and you just overlay a, a, a one on top of each other. Right, and that is what makes up a eye diagram. Okay, so that's what they're saying. I see the oscilloscope shows the superposition, I one on top of each other. That's what it means. Right. Um, the resulting pattern of doing something like that looks like the human eye, hence the name, an eye diagram. Um, and you don't have to do it just for one bit time. In fact, most of the time they do it for two, two bit, two bit intervals, right? Um, and you, you'll see why in a little bit. It, it's a little bit of a, a, a minor detail. Uh, for most practitioners, because we already assume that everybody's going to use two periods or two bit times. Now, uh, let's start off with an ideal non-return zero signal, uh, you know, sort of rectangular pulses, right, like this. So if I take this pulse, right, notice this pulse, let's say we started here, goes up and comes, goes right back to the original spot. If I start looking at it just in one interval, Start, here's a spot where it started, goes up, goes up, and down, and then it returns to this point, right? Because I'm going to take the next post. The next one when, uh, is, a, is a zero, so it goes down. So again, you go down, then you come back to the original point. And then the next one, and you come back to the original point, and you keep doing that, and you end up with something that looks rectangular. If you take two bit times, when, well, you have two rectangles. Now we know we don't transmit that sort of a pulse, right? We transmit more of a pulse that looks 
more roundish like uh, in figure C here. Now, if you did that and you did the same sort of exercise that I did, if you look at just one uh, bit interval, you get something that looks like this. And now you start seeing, oh, yeah, it's beginning to look like a human eye. And if you have two of them, well, then you have two human eyes, right? So th there's your eye diagram. Okay. Now, it's really cool, right, uh, to look at, it, at the ideal ones. But what if I have a signal that went through the channel and picked up some distortion? Well, when you look at the eye diagram, well, they don't look as nice anymore, right? Uh, kind of looks a little bit messy, but it still is, has that information for you, right? Well, um, so what we're trying to do is see an eye diagram. You notice the, the, the middle point? Look at how nice and open that is. Notice that when you have distortion, it's no longer wide open. And that is where the eye diagram begins to give us information. Um, with proper timing extraction, the receiver should always sample the receive signal right at the middle where the eye is totally open or is most open, if you will, right? Um, that's because the center of the eye diagram actually represents the best sampling instance. Right. If you're if you're doing the, the job properly, you should see the maximum opening at the middle of the eye diagram. Right. Um, these are this is pretty much saying the same thing that I just said. Right. So by the time you look at the one that distorted, you can see that the eye is partially closed. Right. That's sort of everything that I was talking about. Right, so this is the one with the distortion, and you have an eye that's partially closed. Right, so a few more things about the eye diagram. In the presence of noise, the eye diagram will tend to partially close in all cases. Right, you have this random thing going around, so it, it's gonna, and, and when you overlay, uh, you know, many of them on top of each other, it kind of shows the eye closing. So weaker noise causes smaller amount of closing, where stronger noise causes more uh, more closing of the eye. Um, observe that for intersimilar interference, the, sim the, the system can tolerate noise, right, for zero intersimilar interference, can tolerate noise up to half the opening, right? Notice that the height of the eye is actually the height of the pulse, right? So, um, or two, two times the height of the pulse, right, from bottom to top. So what they're saying is before the eye completely closes, you have half of that, which is nothing more than the pulse uh, amplitude, okay? And what they're saying is that any noise value larger than that will cause a decision error, right? And if you look at that waveform where, that I was, I was showing you a little while ago, let me go back to that. Uh, no, I have this one, right? In this case, you violate th that thing that I just said. So if you were to look at this eye diagram, this amount of noise has crossed that threshold, and therefore the eye would show as, uh, as if it were closed. Okay. Um, here's where we were. Um, if you do have inner symbol interference, right, that reduces the eye opening and therefore reduces even more the tolerance to noise, right? Because now the opening of the eye is less, right? Um, you can use the eye diagram to determine or to design your equalizer. Equalizers, for the most part in a digital system, will be. Uh, for those of you who have taken signal processing, a finite impulse response filter. So it helps you determine that you have the right taps for your equalizer, for example. Okay. Again, you're always looking to have a maximum vertical and horizontal eye opening. Okay. So the eye, the eye diagram doesn't have to just stay open in the, in the vertical di dimension. It should also, in the horizontal dimension, also stay as wide open as possible. Right. Remember, the really ideal one was the one that looks rectangular. So what you're trying to do is have it as open as you can. Now, for diagnosis, 
uh, using eye diagrams. Uh, we already said this is a really effective tool, right? Um, and you can use them in real time. That means a, a receiver or transmitter, and you re can look at this thing real time at the, uh, at the input anywhere, right? Uh, it is, again, simple to generate. And it, it, and it gives you all kinds of information about the quality and vulnerability of your signal. Now, uh, here's a sketch of an eye diagram. And uh, this is something that you should take as a reference. Uh, if, if you're in this field, this is a good reference to have, right? This picture here is really good. Um, let's talk about some of, some of these parameters that we're showing here. So the eye opening amount at the sampling instance, right? Um, indicates the amount of noise that can the detector can tolerate without making an error. So what we're talking about, this is your noise margin, right? From whatever the, the this, uh, remember these are all kinds of traces one on top of each other, right? So from wherever the, the highest one is to the mid level, right? And the mid level is easy to determine here for the eye diagram. This is your noise margin, right? That's how much more noise you can add without incurring in an error, right? Remember, because this is going to be our optimum sampling instant, right, is also at the maximum eye opening. So the, uh, right off the bat, you can see there's two uh, pieces of information that you get just by just looking at the eye diagram, right? A couple more, right? Um, So it is also desirable to have an eye with a maximum horizontal opening, right? This is the error-free sampling region, right? So that's a good the good thing to have. The, 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 the wider that is, the better. Notice again, because you have a whole bunch of traces, one on top of each other, This there's a certain width that goes on here. So from this point to that point, you can actually sample anywhere in between, right? Notice that from this point to that point where it says error-free sampling, even if my timing is off a little bit, see, it tells you how much timing error you're gonna have, I can still detect whatever uh, this one was correctly, right, that bit, these bits are correctly in here. Like, so if it closes in the, in the horizontal sense, your timing, you're more, much more sensitive to timing error. Right? And timing error comes in the form of jitter. So jitter is um, when you're looking at timing, it doesn't always happen at the same point. And noise has a lot to do with that. Um, there's other mechanisms that cause jitter, which is to have your clock sort of wander around the right uh, timing or right uh, sampling point, right? But um, the wider the eye in the horizontal, the less sensitive you are to that. Um, uh, the various uh, kind of seen from the width of the eye, the measurement provided the time there. Um, oh, the, the circle. <laughs> right, so the level crossing ambiguity shows how much timing jitter you can actually tolerate, right? So this is actually telling you that whatever your clock is, this is how much jitter you have. And again, the die diagram just gives you so much information. By the way, I forgot to mention in the prior slide, this slope, if you can determine kind of what the average slope is, uh, it tells you what the sensitivity to sampling time is, right? So if you go too far away, that means that your error detection becomes um, uh, more sensitive to timing error, right? Because now you're kind of closer to the edge. The same thing here. So how fast is the, these uh, slopes are gives an indication of that. Um, here's an eye diagram example for an actual pulse. So we are using a cosine raised filter with a roll off factor of 0.5. Um, And this is polar signaling, so ones and zeros, right? Plus one and minus one, that's a polar signaling. Um, and um, I guess there's not much else to, to, to talk about here. Uh, you guys can read the, 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 the text here. But this is what you would typically see 
for um, you know a, a polar waveform with uh, that um, cosine rays filter. Okay. All right. So that's it for part one of this lecture. In part two, we're going to talk about digital carrier modulation and MRE modulations and ASK, FSK, PSK, and QAM modulations. We'll also be talking about that. So I'll see you guys in the next lecture.